to Elizabeth Benjamin from Birmingham, who is going to talk about Etranger en moi-même, Sartre Camus, and Avant Garde Alterity. Thank you. What is a rebel? A man who says no. But this refusal does not constitute a renunciation. He is also a man who says yes from the outset. Camus and Sartre such were both highlights an intrinsic link between radical art and radical philosophy in the 20th century. It's Camus asserting that art and rebellion are two parts of the same nihilism that live in the same contradiction, and Sartre stating that what art and morality have in common is that in both cases it is about creation and invention. The artist as rebel rewrites the world on his own terms, both reflecting upon and instigating modifications to an imperfect, an imperfect society. Sorry. We can use Camus' account of rebellion through its dual cause of nihilism and joy, and Sartre's vision of rebellion through creativity and invention in philosophy and art, as an analytical framework to develop a deeper understanding of the avant-garde's furious destruction of traditional artistic and cultural values. This paper will develop this framework through a reassessment of Dada, a whirlwind movement that sought to upturn social values and interrogate artistic identity. Despite their commonly held perception as two predominantly nihilistic movements, both Dada and existentialism can be seen as positive affirmations of humanity through the desire not only to break down convention, but also to replace it with a new identity where values stem from the individual. This is particularly evident if we consider these two movements alongside each other in an exploration of the linguistic and theoretical convergence, as well as their shared preference for the blending of art and life. The paper will expand upon three statements by Dada and existentialist thinkers that underpin the humanistic dilemma at stake for the artist as rebel. Tristan Zara, founder of Dada, stated that in Zurich, I gradually became a stranger to myself. Camus explained that the absurd individual describes themselves as a stranger to myself, and Sartre claimed that man is always outside of himself. This paper will assess the links between art, literature, rebellion, and philosophy to address the notions of order, outside of, uh, and étranger, stranger, foreigner, outsider, too, etc., in order to question whether alterity and or self-alterity is the state most suited to a productive confrontation with the human condition. To this end, the paper will analyse Dada works alongside the literary output of Camus and Serge in order to posit the inherent authenticity of alterity within rebellion, as rebellion within the self. This will be done in four areas. Firstly, we will investigate the role of the Dada mask in relation to Sartre's notion of the look, particularly in respect to his play Miklou, Secondly, we will assess the role of the ready-made in relation to signs of the plague in Camus' La Peste. Thirdly, the role of the trial in L'Etranger in relation to Dada's mock trial of Maurice Barres. Finally, the role of the diary form in Sartre's La Nausée in relation to the Dada diaries and their writing and rewriting of the self. In linking rebellion and art via nihilism, Camus draws upon a common accusation levelled at both Dada and existentialism. From its very beginnings in Zurich, Dada was characterised by a desire to destroy, springing from a rejection of the institutions that had led to the war surrounding it, primarily the dependence on pre-made values and unquestioning support of traditional narratives. We can see that this rejection is something that Dada would share with existentialism and came to produce the creation and invention that we've seen in Sartre. The creative rewriting of the self can be see th seen through the mask, in its verbal or psychological form in Sartre's Vicure, and in its physical form in Dada's beginnings at the Cabaret Voltaire. Zurich. So doomed to spend an eternity in hell, as represented by a small room with no mirrors, the three condemned characters of Wiklo are only able to see themselves through each other. Not being able to perceive herself directly, Estelle goes as far as to question her own existence, lamenting that, when I cannot see myself, I have to check myself by touch, and even then I wonder if I really exist at all. The plot revolves around the construction and deconstruction of layers of the individual's personalities, as each reluctantly comes to admit the reason for their damnation. Simon describes the room in Huclo as being no room at all, but rather the open arena of incriminating exposure and persecution. While this initially reflects the way the characters feel about being stuck together, we might see that from an external point of view, constantly questioning each other's reality allows them to come, come to accept themselves, or simply to take responsibility for living their choices. As Gassan notes at one point, we are what we will ourselves to be, and Innes continues, you are nothing more than your life. Each of the characters initially attempts to detach themselves from the truth of their former existence. It is through the acerbic commentaries of their peers that they can view themselves from an hors de soi position, eventually coming to deconstruct their layers of lies, take responsibility for their actions, and own their characteristics. In contrast,
contrast with Zwickel, we can look at one of the early Dada events at the Cabaret Voltaire, when Marcel Yanko created a set of masks for Dada performance, one of which we saw at the beginning of this slide. His fellow Dadaist Hugo Bau described the effect of their intro- that the introduction of these masks had on the adherents and the movement, detailing their sensational effect in the small space of the cabaret. He says, Not only did the mask immediately call for a costume, it also demanded a quite definite, passionate gesture, bordering on madness. Through this maddening state, Bau claimed that the mask simply demanded that their wearers start to move in a tragic, absurd dance. What fascinates us about the masks is that they represent not human characters and passions, but characters and passions that are larger than life. Through Bell's description, we can immediately see a relationship between this experience with the masks and Riclo, particularly through Sartre's notion of the look, by which we struggle with the notion of the other as subject, and consequently the self as object of the other. As well as foregrounding the externalisation of larger-than-life characters and emotions, exploring close-up of the concerns of the time, the Dada mask brings the wearer, or de soi, to its demand for madness. This is particularly poignant if we consider the etymology of the French démence, madness, that is, D plus mens, outside of one's mind. In contrast with Simon's depiction that we saw of Riclo as an open arena of incriminating exposure and persecution, we can see the rooms of the cabaret as an open arena of creative exploration and interrogation, its activities exposed, but as a means of catharsis through the highlighting of the horror of our time, paralyzing background of events. Additionally, while the characters of Wiklo are doomed to an eternity of incriminating reflection, the Dada mask was used beyond this dissimulatory purpose as a means to actively construct an alternative visage and identity. Sartre's concept of the look is fundamental to both scenes we've just described. The transfer of the objectivity of the other to the objecthood of the self to the other creates a mutual need for the reassessment of identity as a whole. The masks in particular provide a creative externalisation of the performed self. As Rich comments on Wiklo, there are no mirrors in the salon because no one can look at himself objectively. Each dresses the different mannequins of his own personality for the other two. This may be seen to rest on bad faith in the case of Gersin, Inez and Estelle, in that they choose to present themselves in ways that they see as attractive to others. They attempt to achieve this through, the constru- through constructing an inauthentic representation of their being for others in order to, to assuage or even deny their guilt and improve their view of themselves through the look of their companions. In the case of the Dada performers, we can see the dressing through the costumes and masks, a drawing on Satra's alignment of choice with authenticity through the forwarding of, a perpetual construction of, characteristics that one has adopted without the pressure of external fetters. The alternative visages of the masks and the alternative perspective of others draw the exploration of alterity into the construction of the self through a layering and selective foregrounding of the hidden facets of our authentic identity. However, we must question this notion of being hors de soi when we become an unwanted other, through being designated out of place. An instructive assessment of this can be seen through an analysis of signs of disease in Camus de Peste and the ready-mates of Marcel Duchamp, which hopefully you'll be familiar with. La Peste depicts a plague-infested town and the effect that this has on its citizens through their responses both to the disease and to each other in a time of crisis. More broadly, it is a comment on the human condition and the response to the unwanted other. We can see this most evidently through the first sign of the plagues, the rats, on whose arrival the opening of the novel proper centres. As the narrator describes, on the morning of April 16th, Dr. Bernard Hue was leaving his office when he stumbled upon a dead rat in the middle of the landing. At that moment, he kicked the animal aside without giving it any further thought and went downstairs. But when he reached the street, the thought occurred to him that the rat was out of place. So he went back to tell the concierge. On hearing the reaction of old Mr. Michel, he realised that his discovery was unusual. He had only thought that the presence of a dead rat was strange, whereas to the concierge, it was a scandal. He was categorical about it. There were no rats in the building. The doctor assured him that there was one on the first floor landing, likely dead, but Mr. Michel was adamant. There were no rats in the building, so someone must have brought it in from outside. In short, it had to be a prank. It is notable that the reaction to the appearance of the dead rats is immediately contradictory, leading on an evasion of responsibility for its consequences. Davis highlights three defences given for the presence of dead rats, which he classes a raisonnement de chaudron, in which several defences are given to counter an accusation, all of which alone are legitimate, but together contradict each other. That is the combination, la présence de sera constituait un scandale, il n'y avait pas de rat dans la maison. Il s'agissait, il s'agissait d'une farce. The presence of this rat was a scandal. There were no rats in the building, it had to be a prank. 
The contradictory reasoning for a rejection of the undesirable can be seen in the art world's response to Dada in general, and specifically to Duchamp's fountain, which we saw on the slide, a urinal, signed but otherwise unaltered, submitted to the exhibition of the Salon des Indépendants in 1917. We can directly compare Davis's selection to the rejection of Duchamp's urinal in that its submission to the exhibition, constituée un scandale, was a scandal, precisely because il n'y avait pas ce type d'objet dans la maison, there were none of this kind of object in the society, and as in the eyes of the society, il s'agissait peut-être d'une farce. It probably had to be a prank, knowing Dada. As Davis remarks, the point is not the truth or falsehood of any of these claims. Rather, each of them serves the same purpose, which is to deny that the concierge could have any responsibility for the rodent's presence. The same shirking of responsibility can be seen in the society's rejection of an object which would later be acknowledged and even celebrated by the very same art world. So consequently, we can regard the success of the ready-made in relation to both the proliferation of dead rats in Oran and the authorities' initial re- reluctance to get rid of them. The fountain may have been removed from entry into the salon, but it was not possible to remove its effect. Perhaps, if the mess is removed too quickly, something is lost which might have been worth preserving. As Richter, a fellow dada, states, after the fountain and Duchamp's break with the New York Salon des Indépendants, there appeared a whole series of puzzling objects. And as the narrator of La Peste relates, everywhere the citizens gathered, piles of rats awaited them. The stunned citizens discovered them in the busiest areas of town. After this initial flurry in both cases, the proliferation loses its effect. In the case of the rats, they disappear almost entirely. However, Davis writes that if the rats disappear from the novel after its early stages, it is not because the challenge to security and authority has been overcome, but because it is now all-pervasive. The ready-mades, as both an early stage in the Dada revolt and as a highly symbolic gesture in the history of art, lose necessity beyond their initial effect. However, both the rats and the ready-mades represent an ir- irreparable and irreversible rupture, creating an irrefutable and ongoing radical influence. Through these reactions to the unwanted other, we can see that Dada and existentialist texts provide creative means to provoking the human subject into readdressing the way they perceive the world, whether that is their view on art or their view in their own ro- of their own, own role in life. This can be seen in the example of the ready-mades through their ability to shock, and in the rats through the citizens' eventual acceptance of responsibility for their own lives and for those of others. Both the rats and the ready-mades engage in the use of alterity to perform a process of levelling. The rats and the plague in general show the levelling of classes through the inevitability and apparent randomness of the disease. The ready-mades provoke a levelling of the concepts of art and anti-art through questioning the value of aesthetic judgement. The negative effects of alterity, the othering and rejection of non-human entities, can also be seen in the inherently human rejection of the non-conformist individual. The designation of out of place is also used to draw attention to those who do not fit with societal norms. Dada and existentialist texts both highlighting this by highlight this by questioning, and in Dada's case ridiculing, the notion of the institutional judgment of others. This can be seen through an assessment of two parodies of the use of justice to enforce an idea of common morality the trial of Merceau in Camus L'Étranger, and the Dada Mock trial of Maurice Barrez. In Camus L'Étranger, the protagonist, Merceau, is arrested after having shot and killed a man in cold blood. The nameless victim is set up as an anonymous pawn in society's desire to persecute Merceau as a scapegoat, as the embodiment of its flaws. Camus continually reminds us that Merceau is brought to justice because he does not fit in with the society of his time. As Sartre succinctly concluded in his assessment of Merceau, He's simply one of those terrible innocent people who become the scandal of society because they not, do not accept the rules of its game. And as Mercer himself describes, he declared that I had no place in a society whose most fundamental rules I ignored, nor could I appeal to it the human heart whose basic reactions I knew nothing about. The novel explores the impossibility of defending oneself against the absurd conclusions of society's need to exclude those who do not fit in with an ideal of what is to be human. Sorry, what it is to be human. So from the point of view of an absurd prosecution, in 1921, the Paris branch of Dada formed a court and took to trial Maurice Barres, writer and right-wing politician involved in the Dreyfus affair. The trial took place in Barres' absence, though he was invited, and accused him of crimes against the security of the mind. This inimitable spectacle of intellectual justice not only questioned the authenticity of an individual who finds it acceptable to portray one's fundamental values, but also raised the issue of the validity of any judgment of said individual. As Breton later explained, the problem was to determine the extent to which a man could be held accountable if his will to power led him to champion conformist values that diametrically opposed ideals of his youth. In short, 
the Dadas were accusing Barras of inauthenticity. Emphasising his status as outsider, Messer reflects upon the generic conformist nature of the jury. He says, I couldn't tell you what marked one out from the next. I had only one impression. I was on a tram, and all these anonymous travellers across from me were scrutinising the new arrival to pick out his absurdities. I know that it's a silly thing to think, because they were looking not for absurdities, but for crime. But there isn't really much difference, and at any rate, that's the idea that came to me. Mercer's foregrounding of the sameness of looking for absurdities and looking for crime reflects Dada's attitude toward the trial of Ferrers. This latter trial had always had the aim of seeking, seeking out absurdity, since it had wanted to point out the inconsistency of character of an author once so respected by the movement's adherents. Mercer additionally brings into question the role of a criminal in the trial, stating that, as a result, I had the strange feeling of being out of place, a bit like an intruder. The discussion of the fate of an individual and its status as as somewhat beyond their control makes us wonder whether Mercer is any less absent than Barras, whose in absentia replacement was a dressmaking dummy. Mercer takes this absence so far as to even feel outside of himself, stating that he had the strange impression of being looked at by myself. Both trials interrogate the problematic nature of judgment of an individual for nonconformity to a given set of expectations. Instructively, it took the trial of Barras for Dada to realise it did not suit nor want a judgmental position. As one of the Dadaists involved expressed, this mockery of justice, carried out seriously, was outside of Dada. Additionally, it might be said that this event actually represented Dada's indictment of itself, since the trial led to the breaking up of the movement. On the other hand, it took the trial of Merthyr for the novel society to realise it did want to persecute him. Initially, the murder charges would not have entailed any great punishment because of colonial indifference, but the trial caused a highlighting of undesirable character traits on the part of the accused, who then needed to be executed for his crime. The questioning of the possibility of objective judgment brings out the fluctuating relationship between the othering of others and the othering of the self. In turn, this reveals the need to question fundamental societal rules, which are so heavily based in precedent or tradition. Camus' presentation of Merceau as outside of society, as well as Dada's realisation of itself as outside of judgment, both reflect both reflect Sartre's comments on choice and individuality, that is, the creative and active application of individual values over the blind acceptance of those of others. This includes an inherent ambiguity as the individual constantly explores and interrogates their own choices. This ambiguity is particularly explicitly shown in La Nuzi. Sartre's protagonist, Fauquantin, shows a similar doubt of his existence that we already saw in Estelle and Miclou when he notes in his diary that my existence was beginning to seriously surprise me. Was I not a mere appearance? La Nose, through its status as a diary novel, foregrounds the need to tell and retell, something which is also evident through the existence of a multitude of varying accounts of Dada, leading to an ambiguous and evolving notion of truth. Here we will look at La Nose in relation to the Dada diary of Tristan Zara, arguably the leader of the movement. The diary form is useful in terms of the levels of detail it employs, which vary in Fokontan's account as well as Sarah's, from the simple documenting of the occurrence of events to the insertion of extensive emotional responses to happenings. This difference is particularly noticeable in La Nose, when Fokontan begins his entry with Rien de Nouveau, nothing new, yet goes on to describe his day in several pages' worth of detail. While Zara tends not to elaborate on the entries that imply such Rien de Nouveau dates, certain small linguistic fragments are repeated in a relatively insistent manner. For instance, he maintains an unusual obsession with red lamps across the chronicle. This suggests a sensitivity to you, an awareness of their effects and significance. And in the case of the red lamps, I've actually found out since writing this paper that it's because the place where Dada started was a former red light district of Zurich, interestingly enough. So Zara's dramatic entry dated June 1916 is an example of the elaboration of certain events and represents a summary of the cabaret. The cabaret lasted six months. Every night we thrust the triton of the grotesque of the god of the beautiful into each and every spectator, and the wind was not gentle. The consciousness of so many was shaken, tumult and solar avalanche, vitality in the silent corner close to wisdom or folly. Who can define its frontiers? Slowly the young girls departed, and bitterness laid its nest in the belly of the family man. A word was born, no one knows how, dada, dada. We took an oath of friendship on the new transmutation that signifies nothing, and was the most formidable protest the most intense armed affirmation of salvation, liberty, blasphemy, mass combat, speed, prayer, tranquility, private guerrilla negation, and chocolate of the desperate. <laughs> this ferocious energy with which this is described implies that this entry is important. 
and aspects of its vocabulary can be found across the rest of the chronicle. Notable are references to explosions and harsh wind, for example, the subtle invention of the explosive wind and the explosions of elective imbecility. The June 1916 entry and its ripples across the diary are reminiscent of Rockentown's bouts of nausea and its effects on his daily existence. Hockentown exper- experiences the waves of nausea as explosions of his senses, often combined with the humidity of Bouville and an unusual sensitivity to the weather. We also see a heightened sensitivity to colour in both accounts, perhaps unsurprising for the artist, who states in his May 1919 entry, inaugurate different colours for the joy of transchromatic disequilibrium and the portable circus velodrome of camouflage sensations. Unlike Zara, however, who revels in this disruption of chromatic normalcy, Hockentown's sensitivity to colour is disquieting when he does not yet understand his nausea. He uh, reports an episode of discomfort on the fluctuating com- colour of a pair of purple braces. The braces are develop fairly visible on the blue shirt. They are all faded, buried in the blue, but it's a false modesty. In fact, they do not let themselves be ignored. They bother me with their pig-headed stubbornness, as if they've stopped en route to becoming purple with a- without abandoning their original intentions. Just as Hockentown's bouts of nausea get more frequent and all-pervading, Zara's diary entries get more clustered and intense as the diary goes on, centering around key events in the history of the Dada movement. We can see the editing process of diaries as a constant redefinition of truth, leading us to definitions of identity and the role of the diary as, so- as something to be re-read. As Raoul claims, the process that aims at defining the self as it recedes into the past paradoxically contributes to the emergence of a new present self as writer and posits the future role of the self as reader. The journal, meanwhile, acquires an autonomous existence as a written text. The autodidact asks Rockantin at one point, don't we always write with a view to being read? We may wonder if this is still the case even if the reader is simply the author, as the notion of rereading will change the course of personal narrative. Additionally, Rockantin expresses his reasoning for writing, I write to clarify certain circumstances and I need to clean myself with abstract thoughts, reminding us of Zara's famous Manifestada of 1918, when he writes that I am writing this manifesto to show that one can perform contradictory actions together in one simple fresh breath. Both Zara's and Rockentown's accounts show the capacity of the diary form as additive and transformative of the self, as well as being an externalisation of identity, to be varyingly read and interpreted by others as well as by its author. Through our Dada and existentialist texts, we've seen a persistent and varying relationship with the notion of alterity, from the othering of objects and the rejection of individuals to the othering of the self. This plays with both Dada and existentialism's emphasis on rebellion, as well as the constant need to question one's values and place in society. Huiclo and the Dada masks showed the usefulness of the layering and deconstruction of the self. La Peste and the Ready Mage showed the ways in which an unwanted other can call into question our own relationship with otherness. The Etranger and the Barra's trial extended this notion to include the self as unwanted other. Finally, La, ne- La Nausée sorry, and the Dada diary foregrounded the creation, creative relationship we can have with the self through notions of telling and retelling. All of these texts and methods showed a necessity to step outside of the self, hors de soi, to access our fundamental authenticity. Dada and existentialism differ methodologically in that existentialism posits the crisis in a philosophical sense, even through their literature, whereas Dada stages or traverses the problem through their creative action. These can be seen as two facets of the same confrontation of alterity and radical thought. Sartre posits the trauma of otherness in Wiklo, and Camus raises the issues of the discovery of the unwanted other in La Peste. By contrast, the Dada masks creatively engage with the staging otherness wrapped around the self, and Duchamp's ready-mates actively insert the unwanted other into everyday life, highlighting its eventual normalisation. Camus presents in Etranger the individual subjected to the judgment of others, and Sartre foregrounds in La Nausée the individual subjected to the alienating reali- reality of daily existence. However, the Dadas literally staged the trial of Barras, um, and in doing so reveal the absurdity of accusations of inauthenticity, and Zara, as an artist, actively and creatively rewrites the world around him. Throughout these works, the existentialists are presenting a constant rewriting of the self. Dada projects this onto a rewriting of the world. While we may point out that chronologically Dada had already attempted to change the world, Sartre and Camus later saw the need to first change the self in order to experience the world differently. Michel Tapier wrote that, until Dada, all the various isms were only outwardly revolutionary. If Dada marked the beginning of true artistic rebellion, 
and the existentialist holds in effect that only the artist or a person living like an artist is really living. It is inherently desirable, if not necessary, to interrogate this identity as a means of aiming for authentic living. We have seen that Camus foregrounded both rejection and acceptance in a way that reminds us of Zara's classification of Dada as the point where the yes and the no and all contradictions meet, bringing out an emphasis on the necessity of ambiguity. Furthermore, this ambiguity lends itself to an individual approach to morality. As Sartre states, in a way choice is possible, but what is not possible is to not choose. And we choose ourselves, uh, sorry, <laughs> running the punchline. Uh, we choose in view of others, and we choose ourselves in view of others. These two movements can be seen to move beyond their designation as nihilistic critiques of society, allowing us to posit the two as striving towards a fundamentally affirmative reassessment of humanity through the perpetual quest for authenticity. Furthermore, we can argue that this authenticity is most effectively achieved through a radical creative relationship with alternative.